Richard Feynman spent the summer of 1948 at a small motel in Albuquerque, working through quantum electrodynamics from scratch. He had the equations, but couldn't make them work consistently. The standard formalism kept producing infinities where there shouldn't be infinities, and physicists had developed elaborate renormalization schemes that Feynman found unsatisfying. So he did what he always did when stuck. He rebuilt the entire framework using only principles he could visualize and defend from first principles. He drew diagrams of particles interacting, developed new mathematical machinery, and ended up revolutionizing field theory. When colleagues asked how he'd done it, he said something like, I had to understand it clearly so I could explain it to the undergraduates. This approach, used by Feynman throughout his career at Caltech, was eventually formalized by others into what we now call the Feynman Technique. The modern version has four explicit steps. First, write the concept's name at the top of a blank page. Second, explain it in plain language as if teaching someone with no background knowledge, specifically imagining you're teaching a 12 year old. Third, when you get stuck or your explanation becomes circular or vague, go back to your sources and study that specific point until you can explain it simply. Fourth, review your explanation and simplify further, replacing technical jargon with accessible analogies and connecting abstract ideas to concrete examples. The idea is that a bright middle schooler knows enough to follow logical arguments, but lacks the specialized vocabulary and background assumptions that let experts hide fuzzy thinking. You can't tell a 12 year old the wave function collapses on measurement and then move on. They'll ask what a wave function is, what measurement means in this context, why it collapses, and what that even means physically. Each of those questions forces you to unpack assumptions. Here's an example. Compound interest sounds straightforward, but it trips up most adults. Following the Feynman technique, you'd write compound interest at the top of your page. Then you'd start explaining. When you put money in a savings account, the bank pays you extra money called interest. If you have $100 and the bank pays you 10% interest per year, after one year, you'd have $110. The compound part means that next year, you'll earn interest on the full $110, not just the original 100. So you'd get $11 in interest instead of $10. Each year, you earn interest on your previous interest. Already, you might be noticing gaps. Why does the bank pay interest? What determines the rate? You realize you're fuzzy on the mechanics, so you go back and learn that banks lend your deposited money to borrowers and pay you a portion of what they earn. Then you continue. The interesting part is how fast this grows. After 30 years at 10% interest, your $100 wouldn't be $400, which is what you'd expect from simple interest. It would be over $1,700. This happens because you're earning interest on interest on interest, and it compounds like a snowball rolling down a hill and getting bigger. This process reveals what you actually understand versus what you can merely recite. Most people can say compound interest is interest calculated on the initial principle and accumulated interest, which is technically correct, but it demonstrates nothing about whether they grasp the underlying concept. The explanation test, that's harder to fake. Feynman developed this instinct working on the Manhattan Project, where he was the youngest group leader and responsible for explaining complex calculations to engineers and military personnel who needed to understand results without becoming physicists. He discovered that forcing himself to explain in simple terms often revealed errors in his own thinking. In one famous example, he was working on uranium diffusion and realized his calculations were wrong only when a colonel asked a basic question about the process that Feynman couldn't answer clearly. The question exposed that Feynman had been using and manipulating equations without fully understanding the physical setup. And he recognized that, and he learned from it. His Caltech lectures became legendary partly for this reason. He'd start a topic by asking, what do we mean when we say X, and build up from basic definitions. Students would realize that terms they'd been using for years, like energy or force, had fuzzy boundaries in their minds. Feynman would construct precise meanings through examples and thought experiments, showing how the concepts related to each other and to observable phenomena. This technique works well for hierarchical knowledge, where concepts build on each other in clear dependency chains, and physics is the obvious example. You can't genuinely understand electric fields without understanding force, and you can't understand force without understanding acceleration, and you can't understand acceleration without understanding velocity. Same with mathematics. When students struggle with calculus, it's often because they never truly understood functions in algebra, which builds on their shaky grasp of variables, which traces back to gaps in reason. The Feynman approach ruthlessly exposes these cascading deficiencies. Try explaining why the derivative of x squared is 2x. You need to talk about rates of change, which means explaining ratios, which means explaining division as groups and parts. Each layer you dig down might reveal misunderstandings that you've carried for years. But watch what happens when you apply this to messier domains. Imagine explaining why World War I started. You write causes of World War I at the top of your page and begin. In 1914, a Serbian nationalist assassinated the Archduke of Austria-Hungary. This set off a chain reaction because countries had made promises to defend each other if attacked. Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia, Russia defended Serbia, Germany defended Austria-Hungary, France defended Russia, and Germany invaded Belgium to attack France, which brought in Britain, who had promised to protect Belgium. Is this simple? Sure. Is it wrong? Also sure, or at least deeply incomplete. 
The July crisis involved miscalculations, domestic political pressures, military timetables that couldn't be stopped, the decline of Ottoman power, Balkan nationalism, imperial competition in Africa, naval arms races, the writings of Clausewitz, and dozens of other factors. You can simplify this into a clean narrative, but you're not capturing the historical reality. The events resemble a complex system where multiple causes operated simultaneously and counterfactually removing any single factor might not have prevented the war. When you go back to study more deeply and try to add this complexity, you face a dilemma. Either you keep the simple explanation and accept that it's misleading, or you make it more accurate and lose the clarity that supposedly defined the technique. The 12 year old friendly version might be useful for introducing the topic, but it's not where real historical understanding lives. Real understanding includes grasping the irreducible complexity and the limits of simplified models. The same problem appears in biology. Explain how evolution works. Animals that survive longer have more babies. Babies inherit traits from their parents. If a trait helps survival, more babies will have that trait. Over many generations, this creates new species. You can drill down on each piece. What is inheritance? What is a trait? What counts as a species? But evolution's actual operation involves population genetics, genetic drift, frequency dependent selection, and mechanisms that don't fit clean narratives. There's a temporal component that gets ignored. The technique, as usually described, treats learning as a, a discrete event. Study, explain, identify gaps, restudy, done. But mastery develops over years of engagement with material. Feynman didn't understand quantum electrodynamics because he sat down and explained it simply to himself. He spent decades calculating, publishing, arguing with colleagues, teaching multiple times, and letting ideas marinate in his subconscious. The ability to explain emerged from depth of engagement, not the other way around. Take programming. You can explain variables, loops, and conditionals to a 12-year-old using concrete analogies. Variables are boxes that hold information, loops are repetition, conditionals are decisions. This gives them the vocabulary and basic concepts. But programming skill comes from writing thousands of lines of code, debugging, reading other people's code, building projects, and developing pattern recognition for common ideas and common problems. The explanation helps with the initial conceptual framework, but it doesn't shortcut the hours of practice required to write code fluently. What the technique does provide is a relentless quality control mechanism for your own understanding. Feynman was paranoid about self-deception, having watched physicists convince themselves they understood things they didn't. In his view, most people never test whether they can reconstruct their knowledge from first principles. They memorize facts and procedures and ideas and hope nobody asks them to derive rather than recite. The explanation test catches cargo cult knowledge by requiring active reconstruction rather than just passive recognition. This is valuable, but it's brutal. If you genuinely apply the technique, you'll discover that most of what you thought you knew, you don't. You've been getting by with keyword associations and surface pattern matching. I have too, we all have. The 12 year old in your imagination asks why at each step and you realize you have no good answer. You've been coasting on familiarity and now the technique is presenting the bill for intellectual debts you didn't know you'd accumulated. So the technique succeeds primarily as diagnosis. It reveals gaps with uncomfortable precision. But after identifying the gaps, you still face the original hard problem actually learning the material. There's no trick that makes this faster. You read, you work problems, you make mistakes, you discuss with others, you sleep on it, you try to use your knowledge, you discover new gaps, and you repeat. Feynman's real gift was his disposition. He was genuinely curious about how things worked at the deepest level, and willing to rebuild his understanding from scratch whenever he sensed confusion. Most of us don't have that level of intellectual honesty or patience. We're satisfied with a good enough understanding for passing tests or holding conversations. Which is fine for most purposes, but when you need real understanding, you can't fake it by following a four-step process. You need to do the work.